Welcome to Windy Night Stories. The night is coming on, and the wind is rising. It's time for a story, and tonight's story is by Charles W. J., the specter of the Hemlock Gorge. The early November storms came down softly upon the earth and covered all the autumnal leaves with a garment of purity and beauty. The subject of the gorge and its mystery had almost lost their hold upon my curiosity when one afternoon the hunter, he who had told me the story of the deserted cabin, chanced to be passing by. I hailed him, and he walked in. He informed me that he was on his way to the old trapping grounds near the head of the lake, on the Wisconsin side, in which neighborhood he expected to pass the winter. I invited him to stay all night and take a fresh start in the morning. He modestly accepted the suggestion, observing that he had walked about thirty miles since daylight, and as the snow had hidden the smaller logs of the forest, pushing his way over and among them was difficult and toilsome work, and that he really felt tired and exhausted. In due time a smoking supper of broiled venison and roasted potatoes, bread being among one of the occasionals of my wilderness home, was ready to be disposed of, and with glorious appetites, braced by abstinence since morning, we two drew up to the table, and silently thanking the giver of all good, proceeded to feast upon his bounties. These fully indulged in, but without gluttony, prepared us for a pleasant evening of social intercourse, and a sound and invigorating sleep, when weary eyelids drooped responsive to a law of nature. Day had now renounced its scepter to the hand of darkness, and the night drew its shadows around our little world without, until neither wood or clearing could be distinguished in the more remote distance. We drew our chairs to the bright and cheerful fire, filled our pipes, and conversed for a while on the usual indifferent subjects of local gossip. These exhausted, I at last ventured to inquire of my usually silent but intelligent visitor, in reference to the dreaded gorge and its accredited mystery. The hunter looked up at me with a quick movement, as if to observe if my request was a jesting one, or instigated by a real interest in what most men of reading and observation would at once set down as an idle and absurd tale, hatched in the undisciplined imagination of ignorant and superstitious woodmen. Then, with the faintest evidence of a smile playing round his mouth, he remarked, And so you have heard of the Hemlock Gorge and what is generally believed to be, here among the settlers, its ghostly inhabitant. Well, you will doubtless laugh at my strange recital, as I would myself if, unknowing the facts, I listened to them from the lips of another. Here the hunter took a few vigorous whiffs at his pipe by way of finishing its contents, knocked out the ashes, returned it to his pouch, and began. A dozen or so years ago, before the hundreds of Chicago lumbermen came into these parts, Deer and bear abounded in great numbers, and this section of the lake shore was considered by hunters and trappers as one of the best for their calling in all of northern Michigan. There was not a single permanent settler for miles around, and not a ten-acre clearing in all that is now called Monona Township. I used to come out here then every winter with a single comrade and partner. He was a Canadian Frenchman named Leclerc, and the most cunning hunter and trapper I have ever met with, and that is saying a great deal in his favor. He seemed instinctively to understand the habits and the lurking places of all the animals of the water in the woods, and he would follow the trail of other hunters who would go miles without seeing horn, hoof, or hide, and Leclerc would return laden with the trophies which had entirely escaped their keenest observation. But the old man was terribly profane, both in his native and acquired language, but for swearing he always seemed to prefer the French until the supply was exhausted and then he would replenish his impoverished vocabulary by copious draughts upon the hardest English expletives. But he was a truly brave veteran of the woods, and as warm-hearted and sympathetic as a woman, in any emergency that appealed to tenderness. He finally died, his broken rifle by his side, knife in hand, and a dead bear's teeth closed around his lacerated jugular. But this is not the story you wish to hear tonight. I had heard something of the haunted gorge, from the lips of old trappers and hunters who had come down to Grand Rapids in the spring to dispose of their winter spoils. But as such stories were common around the lodge fires, and were always listened to by the younger men, with an honest belief that the most extravagant exaggeration could not impair. I listened to them only for the amusement of an idle hour, but as one or two men of heartier judgment, more truthful, and of less vivid imagination, solemnly assured me that they had personally been confronted by the specter, I became interested in the question, 
and resolved to embrace the first opportunity to seek an introduction to the supposed apparition. The season I came out here with old Leclerc, we built our lodge within a mile of the haunt of the dreaded specter, and the second morning after our arrival, we shouldered our rifles, uncoupled our hounds, and started for the gorge. I observed that the face of the old man wore a serious and troubled look, and that not a single profane expression had broken from his lips during the entire morning. I verily believe that but for fear of having his established bravery questioned, which was his only pride, he would have flatly refused to have accompanied me in what must turn out to be either a silly or a frightful adventure. But the old hunter had the natural weakness of men of our calling and habits, and he bore the conceited reputation of, fearing neither man nor devil, to flinch now from the side of a comrade, in dread of a ghost, would furnish a text for ridicule around all the campfires along the lake shore. As soon as we reached the entrance of the gorge, the hounds broke out in full cry and went in on a run. A herd of five deer had not been half an hour ahead of us. Leclerc at once caught the excitement so natural to the occasion, and with a shout of encouragement to the hounds, sprang past me and with a rapid step pushed forward upon the trail. The first excitement of the chase over, my attention was attracted to the strange features of the place we were treading. The sides were almost perpendicular, while high above us the mighty hemlocks leaned over the abyss, their mingled tops forming so close a cover that not one ray of sunshine could break in upon the solemn gloom by which we were enshrouded. Of course it was the fever of imagination, but I did fancy that I felt the fanning of invisible wings in the motionless air, and a rank, graveyard odor seemed to ooze out from the sides of the gorge and to rise up from the moldering, rotten vegetation into which our feet sank at every step. I had heard of the valley in the shadow of death, and here seemed the fearful realization of it in the wilderness and upon the earth. To tell the truth, a fear to which I had heretofore been a stranger began to usurp possession of my faculties. But the old man had become so absorbed in the hunt and in listening to the baying of the dogs that he seemed to have entirely forgotten all his previous misgivings, his present surrounding of a superstitious nature, and began to let loose his restrained profanity with prodigal volubility. He had just delivered himself of a shocking malediction against a hidden root, over which he had stumbled, when a low, whimpering cry was heard a short distance ahead, and a moment thereafter, both dogs came bounding towards us, both dogs came bounding toward us, shivering in an agony of fear, and crouched down against Leclerc, who was about a dozen yards in advance of where I stood. The old man, who had been closely observing the trail from the time of our first entering, raised his eyes at this singular action of his petted and favorite animals, and looked straight ahead in the direction from which they had so unexpectedly come. I shall never fully free my vision from the scene which followed this sudden action of the old hunter. In an instant, he stood as one petrified. His rifle dropped from his hand and rattled against a stone. I could not see his eyes, but I knew that some horrible fascination had riveted their gaze. I hastened to his side as fast as the little power of motion left me would permit. He raised his right arm slowly from his side, pointed up the gorge, and sank down upon the ground. I looked in the direction indicated. About a hundred feet in advance, between two dead hemlock trees, stood a figure completely enveloped in a black shroud. It was motionless, but erect. The outlines were unmistakably human. Strange to say, my terror had in a measure left me the moment the object was discerned, and my faculties of observation seemed rather sharpened than impaired. I tried every mode of reasoning that would assist to the belief that what I saw was rather an illusion than a reality. It would not do. The dreadful apparition was too palpable, too well defined too distinct from the nature of all its surroundings, to be classed with any real substance. Even as I looked, it sank slowly into the ground, and then as slowly rose up to its former proportions. A shadowy arm protruded through the shroud, pointed to a spot on the side of the precipice close to the floor of the gorge, the arm slowly shrank back beneath its covering, and then the object gradually melted away and was gone. I looked around upon my companion. He was sitting up, and had evidently witnessed all that I had myself seen. His face was very pale, but a more subdued expression by far was upon his features than I had ever seen there before. At last, he said, Comrade, we will not now talk about what we have just witnessed. Let us return. 
Tomorrow we will come here again and examine the spot to which the spirit pointed. Take your hatchet and blaze this tree. Then we shall be certain of the place. Neither of us had any appetite for supper that night, and the small hours of the morning were upon us, ere we ventured to seek repose in sleep. The dogs lay stretched before the fire, but were as wakeful as their masters, whining piteously at intervals, as though disturbed by some invisible intruder. But the weary hours of the night dragged their slow length along, and the wished-for day dawned at last. A few mouthfuls of cold venison, eaten without appetite, sufficed for our breakfast, and the sun was just coming out of the east as we started on our journey to try to investigate the ghostly mystery of the previous day. We walked on, slowly and in silence, over the intervening mile. The blazed tree was soon found, and then we approached the two old hemlocks, between whose dead trunks the vision had been discovered. I stepped at once to the spot on the side of the precipice to which it had pointed, and commenced the examination. Nothing unusual was to be seen from the first curious glance we cast around. We were beginning to look upon the affair as a delusion, or some natural phenomenon that had deceived our heated senses, and I commenced joking Leclerc about our childish fancies. But to be more fully satisfied on this point, I turned my face toward the dead hemlocks to see if we had the right range of the spot toward which the specter had pointed, and there it stood again, right within ten feet of us, its shrouded figure so clearly defined as to remove all doubt of the perfection of our senses. I touched my comrade upon the arm. He looked up, and his eyes followed the direction of my own. Even as we stood, in breathless silence, and gazed in awe, a shadowy arm gradually protruded from the shroud and pointed to the spot upon which we stood. It is strange, but neither of us were in the least shaken with fear. A solemn sense of some dread, but unknown duty devolving upon us, was the only sensation by which we were affected. In a few moments the specter slowly faded away, as on the day previous. Then Leclerc took the muzzle of his rifle, and parted the low bushes and matted vines that had grown out of the side of the slope, where it rested on the bottom of the gorge. And then the discovery was made. The mouth of a cave, about twenty inches in diameter, right in front of which, and pressing against it, was the body of a young hemlock of about a dozen years' growth. A quantity of decayed branches, leaves, etc., partially filled the mouth of the cavern, and these, with the tree in front, interfered with our explorations. But we had our hatchets with us, and it took but a few minutes to bring the tree to the ground. The accumulated rubbish was easily removed, and the feet and skull of a ghastly human skeleton were revealed. A pair of pantaloons and a shirt still clothed the rest of the skeleton in their rotten folds. A hat lay on the bottom of the cave. On examining this, we discovered a piece of paper inside, which had evidently been torn from the inner lining of the hat. On this was written with a pencil the following, which we found but little difficulty in deciphering, the cave being of sandy formation and removed from all damp surroundings. The lines read thus, I know that I am dying, and I feel that an angry God is here. In my life I scoffed at his name and derided his promises and his threatenings. In my dying hour he has closed his mercy against me. Hope is gone forever, and a black eternity opens before me. Should my remains be discovered, the prayer of a dying wretch is, they may be removed to the burying grounds of some Christian church. January 1851 Upon after inquiry, I learned that in the same month of the same year, a vessel had been wrecked on the coast near by the gorge, and it was supposed that all hands had perished. There is little doubt that one of the passengers had reached the shore, wandered into the uninhabited wilderness, and finally crept into this cave and perished of cold and exhaustion. We left the skeleton precisely as we had found it and returned to camp. After supper, we discussed the matter between us and agreed upon a plan of action. There was a little log Methodist church at Pentwater, about twelve miles distant, and we resolved to start with the remains the next day and comply with the last request of the unhappy stranger. In the morning we found it impossible to get material to make a box, so we took one of our blankets and went back to the cave, carefully removed the skeleton, wrapped it up in the blanket, carried it to the beach, deposited it in our log canoe, and rowed for Pentwater. It was growing dark when we reached our destination, for the lake was up in its wrath, 
and what little headway we could make was amid the greatest dangers. We saw no one on our way to the little graveyard, for it was some considerable distance from the half-dozen huts that composed the settlement. With our paddles, we soon dug a hole of sufficient depth in the sandy soil, deposited the remains, and covered them from sight. Then the old man grasped me by the hand and said, Comrade, I need not tell you that I have been a very wicked man, and of violent deeds and of blaspheming tongue. What you and me have recently witnessed is a warning from heaven to us both. Henceforth and forever I renounce my evil ways, as far as grace is given to me to resist temptation, and I know that prayer is mighty and will prevail. Let us pray for the dead. And we kneeled down upon the new-made grave of the stranger, and the old man poured forth a fervent supplication with a sincerity of soul that I fear is seldom heard in the great churches of your eastern cities. And then we arose and departed for our boat, better men than we had ever been before. I never heard a profane word from the lips of Leclerc afterward, nor even a momentary ebullition of anger at any trivial annoyance. And his changed deportment had a wonderful influence upon the rude men of the wilderness, with whom he associated, for they knew there was none of the sham of hypocrisy in the rough old French hunter. That is a vice that only pays where there is refined society. And now, said the hunter, after a short pause, and turning his clear, honest blue eyes full upon my face, of course you don't believe my strange story. I cannot ask you to. I would not believe it myself, had it been told me by another. And yet, he added, after musing a few moments, the human mind, in the learned or ignorant, the profane as well as the pious, is always moved to either clear or doubtful credulity at stories of the supernatural. And how can there be belief in that which is impossible? There can be no superstructure, material or spiritual, without foundation. Therefore I hold that the mere fact that our race, savage, barbaric, or Christianized, all have their superstitions, is proof positive of a divine cause that produces this universal effect. I will go further and say that all of mental action is from God. That man may pervert and misdirect is another question. But there can be no superstition without a reality for its basis. If the dead do not live again, we could not think they do. The hour was now late, and we retired. It was long before sleep broke in upon the meditations which the hunter's story had set in action. Dear reader, there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamed of in your philosophy. The End